Okay, this morning folks, let's open up your Bibles to John chapter 8. And once again, we are preaching through the book of John. We're exegeting the scriptures. In other words, we're trying just to take portions of scripture along and uh, bring out what God wants us to understand on that. And sometimes uh, you will give me insight uh, to maybe look at it from a little different angle than what I have before. Uh, one thing that so far through our study in the book of John that's a little bit new uh, that I haven't done personally whenever I preach through the book in the past is bring out the idea of the light. Okay? And Jesus is the light. Uh, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was God. And all things were made by Him. And that word was the light of men. And the light is the what? Perception. Perception of God. And so whenever we're born, and I was talking with someone just this past week, uh, talking about uh, uh, knowing God and being able to know Him. And talked about, you know, that uh, we have an understanding of God. Well, when we're born, even though our soul, or our spirit, excuse me, is lying dormant because of Adam's sin, still God gives us His life, portion of it, not the uh, whole ability to know it, but just a small portion of it to give us life itself, or a physical life, and enough light through that uh, life that we know to accept Him. Uh, I've heard people ponder through the years and wonder and even worry sometimes about uh, the unreached peoples of the world. You know, how can they ever come to know Jesus and be saved if, you know, they don't have the Bible, if they don't have, you know, things? Well, Scripture itself tells us that there is enough witness of God in nature itself that people can understand uh, God Himself and the plan of salvation. And that's intermingled with that portion of light that God gives us when we're born. But whenever we get to that point where we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, where we realize that we are sinners and that there's no way that uh, we can have a relationship with God uh, on our own because we can't be good enough. God's a perfect being. We can't be perfect. And we realize that uh, Jesus did come. He died on the cross for our sins. And we accept what He did on the cross, His death, burial, resurrection, and even ascension into glory. And we accept that, not just the knowledge of it, but accept it to the point where it makes a life change in us. Okay? We are born again. And at that point, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the family of God. He enters our being, and we, we receive uh, the right to, or the exposure to the total light and understanding of God. Now, we don't at that time have a full understanding, because we still wrestle with the old nature, and in this world we can't have it. Uh, Paul puts it this way. He says, now we see through a glass darkly. What in the world does that mean? Do uh, you pull the shades down in your house at night? Yes. Okay. Now, if somebody's passing your house in the evening after dark, and you don't have any lights on inside, and the shades aren't full, can they see in your house? If your lights are off? Off. Because it's dark in there, you can't see. Okay, but the moment you turn the lights on, then they can see. You better have the shades full, right? <laughs> okay, and that's what uh, Paul's talking about here. He said, in this life, even though we're saved, and even though we have the ability to know God and all about God, we, we don't really see the fullness of God. Because we're looking at a glass darkly and all we see is our reflection. You know. But when we get to heaven, we will know as we are known. Okay? 
then we will not have the old nature. We will have the we'll, we'll be like God created Adam and Eve in the beginning, okay? And we'll have the full knowledge of God at that point. But in this world and in our study, and I'm kind of bringing that out as we go through here, is that uh, we have the ability to learn more and more and understand more and more and perceive more and more about who God really is and how he wants us to mimic him. Because that's the whole purpose in us being here beyond the day we accept Christ as our personal Savior so that we might grow and mature in Christ and become more and more like him. Right down to the uh, name we call ourselves, Christians. Christ. Little Christ. 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 Little Christ. Images of Christ. And that's what we're supposed to be striving for. Okay. Now we're going to go through a very familiar story for most of us this morning because it's the woman that's caught in the act of adultery. And again, uh, God's taking me a little different perception of what he's teaching here than what we have. I may mention a few of the things that we've brought up in the past, you know, to remind us. But let's read together uh, John 8, 1 through 12. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. Okay, now let me back up just a minute. Remember where he is here. He's come to the Feast of uh, Tabernacles, okay? He's in Jerusalem. He's been, uh, you know, the brothers and sisters, uh, he, uh, physical brothers and sisters, biological, said, uh, you know, you come up. And he said, no, I'm not coming. So he let them go, and he came after them uh, secretly. And then about mid part of the week, he started to teach in the temple, okay? And so he's been doing that, and he's been teaching there uh, in the temple. He's had to run in a little bit with the uh, Pharisees, not uh, major yet. But the people are wondering, and we brought that out last week, you know, the people are wondering, well, if the Pharisees want to kill him, why won't they come get him? He's right here, you know, he's teaching preaching. And some of the people were saying, well, uh, he couldn't be the Messiah because we know his family. We know where he came from. And he came from Galilee. He didn't come from Bethlehem. You know. And uh, so others of them said, no, how, you know, nobody else could do the miracles that he's done except to be the Messiah. So some people were accepting him as the Messiah, and others were not, and the Pharisees were keeping an eye on him, but they really hadn't reached out to him yet. Now, in the past, and up to this point, he's used uh, synonyms for God, okay? To start with, he said, I am the bread of life, okay? And then it didn't bring it out real strong last week, but we read through it. Uh, at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, they had the uh, ceremony of the water, where they bring the water up, and I explained that to you, how they bring it up from the well and pour it over the altar and all. And uh, he told them that in uh, chapter 7, verse 37, 38, he said, if you're thirsty, come and drink. Drink of me. I'm talking about Jesus himself. If you drink of me, there'll be within you a spring of water swelling up, talking about the Holy Spirit in the ends, okay? So he said, I am the bread of life. He said, I'm the water, okay? And he said, I am the light of the world, okay? Back in the uh, beginning of the book of John. He's going to say that again here. You'll pick up on it in verse 12. Okay, so he's been preaching. He went out to Mount of Olives. What did he do there? That's where he went for respite, to rest, to sleep, to, you know, recoup. Early the next morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her up in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what saith thou? In other words, what's your sermon title? What do you say? 
Okay? Moses said, well, do this. And Jesus said, what do you say? They're trying to trap him here. Okay? They're looking for something to hang on him to where they can arrest him, go through the trials, and crucify him, mention him. But what do you say about this? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted of their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. Okay, nobody knows what he wrote in the sand or the dirt or whatever there. But it's uh, commonly thought that what he was doing was writing the sins of the men who had brought her to them so that, uh, you know, he would get them. And more or less, uh, what he's doing here is uh, teaching the principle to these Pharisees, and to anybody who's reading the scripture now, what Paul brought out, brought out in his uh, letters, uh, judge not lest you be judged. Now, a lot of people like to say that, you know, because when they're doing something wrong and you try to reprove them, you know, and try to help them uh, see that what you're doing is wrong, they'll tell you, well, you're not supposed to judge because the Bible says judge not, right? But what that scripture, it isn't saying that you don't judge at all, okay? Now, there's one thing we cannot judge about, and that's whether a person is saved or unsaved. Only that person and God know for sure. But we can be what inspectors? Fruit. We can look at their life and see what's going on. And we can compare people's lives to the Word of God. And we're supposed to do that. In the book of Galatians, uh, I believe it's in chapter 3, it says if you see a brother in a fall, you go to that brother and you try to explain to them what they're doing that's contrary to the Word of God and lovingly try to bring them where they can, you know, are convicted of it, they confess it, and they ask uh, forgiveness of it, and they, you know, get right with the Lord. We're supposed to do that. Uh, so that's sort of what he's showing us here. In other words, you Pharisees here, you brought this woman because you say she's got a sin, and of course you're tempting Jesus in what you're doing, you're trying to try him, but you're trying to get this woman convicted. What about yourself? Have you considered yourself? Okay? Judge not lest you be judged brings out the idea that if we judge other people, we will be judged by the same measure. And God will judge us. And He will hold us accountable. So does that mean we never try to correct people that are wrong? No. We just make sure our own lives are free as much as we can from sin as we go into it, okay? So maybe he was writing their sins there, but whatever he was doing brought these men under conviction. And in the Old Testament law, you, you had to have witnesses for a person to be condemned, even before the Sanhedrin or whoever they were bringing them for. So what Jesus comes up and says here, he's standing there alone with a woman, verse 10, when Jesus lifted up, uh, up himself and saw none, of, uh, saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? In other words, you're brought here. Now, this woman, did she know she was guilty of that sin? She did. But if Jesus said, Where? The law says you've got to have accusers, witnesses. Where are they? She said, I have none. I have none. Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man. And Jesus said unto her, What? Okay. 
the scripture and God is leaving this open a little bit to our own not interpretation but understanding of what's taking place here this woman knew she was guilty did Jesus know she was guilty okay so he's not condemning her for her sin so we know in our study and our knowledge of New Testament scripture the only way that we are not condemned from, for sin is by what? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. And when does Jesus forgive us of our sins? Of salvation, when we believe upon him. And then when we confess afterwards, when we're convicted of. So in this little verse here, I, I've got to have the conjecture that in this woman's heart, and in her relationship with Jesus, she was believing on him at this point, okay? And there are some uh, Bible scholars, if you read some of the commentaries and uh, histories, you know, way back in uh, history, uh, some people think that this is one of the women that became a part of the entourage with Jesus and following him around. She became a believer. Uh, he didn't condemn her of her sins. As a matter of fact, she received forgiveness of it. But uh, he also brings out a good point here, which I always bring out whenever we talk about this. In uh, verse 11, it says, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. In other words, you've got the perception of who God is and how he deals with men. You've got enough light to know now. Don't do this anymore. We should never be guilty of the same sin that we have to confess before God twice. Once I'll do it, and His forgiveness I'll get it, and then move on to the, <laughs> to the next one, okay? Or the next thing that God enlightens us about as we go. Okay. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. The perception of God, the knowledge of God, who He is. I am He. I am God. I, you can see Him in and through me. Uh, he that followeth me shall not walk in what? Okay, we talked about that before. What is darkness? Evil. Uh, outside of the will of God. He just told this woman, go and sin no more. So let's not sin. If we know it's sin, let's stay away from it. Okay? And as God brings it to us, let's confess it and stay away from it. They shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light. Right? See that light of life. Okay? Now this begs us to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'll ask you to turn over there with me, if you will, the book of 2 Timothy. Because again, Paul, whenever he's instructing Timothy, and remember what he's doing here, he's giving instruction uh, to a preacher boy, what they used to call him Timothy. Uh, a young man who's coming up and learning to pastor and to preach in churches and so on, and to lead people. So as Paul was instructing Timothy here, uh, I want to read the totality of chapter 3. We've got time to do it. And then we're going to come back and touch on a couple of scriptures here. 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days, when are the last days? We're in them. Yeah. Okay, right now, folks. Yeah. I've got up. You know, I've preached for a good many weeks about the end times, the last days, we're on the premises. You know, these are the end of the last days, uh, last of the last days, however you want to put it. But uh, we're there. Just because I don't mention it every Sunday doesn't mean that we're getting further away from it. We're here. And you guys, if you watch what's going on, you can tell. Okay? And it's very evident in the world around us. In the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, 
unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. Now, folks, if you cannot read that scripture and see the world around us today, you need to get yourself a set of glasses, okay? <laughs> because we are there. Uh, our community, our nation, our world, uh, the mindset of people, uh, the churches, and even local churches that we know have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of their own. They have a form of godliness, but they don't hold up the, the holiness and the righteousness of God himself. They allow unrighteousness in the midst and so on. So it says, turn away from those things. The end times are coming and we're there. So watch out for these things and stay clear of them. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, laden, uh, led away with divers' lusts. Ever leaning, or learning, excuse me, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Now, what in the world do you mean by that? It means they read and they study, and even the preachers that are preaching heresy right now, they study and they read the Bible. But they're learning about the words and the uh, uh, physical understanding of the words, but they do not have a perception. What is that perception? The light of God. In other words, there's preachers in the pulpit today that are not saved. They, you know, they, they've gotten into a profession. And uh, some of them are making a real nice livelihood off the profession uh, that they're into. Okay? But I'm getting my tongue all tangled up up here. Okay, but they are not, haven't got the, the, the light of the Word, the understanding of the Word. And that's what we want to make sure that we have whenever we study the Word of God. And we start putting into practice what we're learning from the Word of God. Make sure that you're a mortgage child of God, you're uh, learning it and understanding it by the perception that God gives us and by the work of the Holy Spirit within us. Okay. Um, verse 8. Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Okay, if you remember that uh, Janes and Jambres was in the, at the mount where uh, Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments, they were the family, and they were priests actually, that tried to stand up and take over and uh, were warring against the truth that God gave to Moses. So that's what he's reminding these Jewish folks about. And they would know that. But they shall proceed no farther, further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. Now he's talking to Timothy, he says, you know what I teach, and what I teach is from God, that's what he's alluding to here. My manner of life, Purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. Uh, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that uh, will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Uh, look at that up a little bit there. But if we live for Jesus, there's persecutions going to come in our life in this world. It'll be. But evil men and seducers hope. Did I flip too much here? Yeah, I went way over. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. In other words, you've got the light of the word, you've got the perception, God has taught you, and uh, set yourself, and base yourself, be assured, base yourself in this understanding from the Holy Spirit. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Okay? So how do I keep myself in the light of the Word? The Holy Scripture. The Word of God. We stay in it. We stay studying it. We allow the Holy Spirit to uh, interpret it to us. And then whenever it gives us an understanding, a perception, we start applying that in our life start living it, okay? And then he explains what the scripture is. And these are the verses that I wanted to come from the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Okay? In other words, she had to go through a process in that one little verse and phrase there that she was convinced of her sin, she was convicted of her sin, she was reproved of her sin, and she had to confess that sin and then she was forgiven that sin and jesus said go and sin no more and that's what is brought out here very well through paul as he's talking to timothy if you'll read this scripture if you'll use this scripture in every aspect of life all scripture is given by inspiration of god now that word inspiration in the Greek means God breathed. Okay? Inspiration. Whenever the 40 men that wrote the scripture, okay, it's 40 men wrote 66 books of scripture over like 4,000 years, I think it was, 2,000, I forget exactly. But um, God shared with them in their mind what he wanted them to write down. They wrote it down by the inspiration of God. Now he allowed them to use their own uh, experiences and their own life experiences. That's why you see a little difference in the Gospels. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they, you know, they don't contradict each other. But all of them remember things a little differently and they wrote it a little differently, you know, and they had styles of writing. But it's inspired. God gave it to them and they wrote it down. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. Okay? So it's good. What's it good for? It's good for doctrine, for teaching. If we're going to teach someone something, it needs to be from this book. The principles that we teach should be from the Word of God. Okay? For reproof, okay, what did the uh, woman thought the act of adultery? She was reproved. God tells us to, if we, you know, have family members, if we have neighbors, if we have church members that are living contrary and different from what God tells us to, we are to reprove them. Show them from the Word of God where they're wrong, okay? But that's what the Word is good for. It's good for teaching, doctrine, for reproof. And once we reprove them, it's good for correction. What is the right way to live? What is the right pattern of thinking to have? It's all in the Scripture. That's what it's here for. And for instruction unto righteousness. Now, when you correct someone and show them correction, you haven't instructed them. You just show them from the Word of God what they should do. The instructions whenever we actually show them how to do it. Okay? But that's what the scripture is good for. And I'll go over those again. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction unto righteousness. Now folks, I've used the application for other people, but it first ought to take place here. It ought to start with myself, yourself. When I read the Word of God, I need to go down through these. And if a man will, uh, you know, correct himself, 
He doesn't need to be corrected by someone else. If he'll take from the Holy Spirit, and God will do that. That's why we can get through the Scripture and pick up some much and, and learn to live for God. And then finally in verse 17, that the man of God may be what? Perfect. How many of you are perfect here today? No. That word in the original language can also be translated as mature. Okay? Not perfect in the fact that it happens to them. But they're mature and they know how to overcome sin. So, not to change the scripture, but to use that translation, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay? So as we look at the woman at the well, and we look at the light that God gives us, and the way he gives it to us throughout uh, our Christian walk, then we know that we can be who God wants us to be in this world. We can lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And we can also prepare and become the person that God is going to use in heaven throughout all eternity. You are preparing right now for what you're going to be and how you are going to exist in the heavenly realm. And there will be stations, okay? There will be stations. Uh, there will be those that, uh, you know, sweep the streets. Well, that's okay, because they're gold. You know, you keep all the dust if you want to. Y'all didn't catch that, did you? Streets are gold. <laughs> but there's no use to much for gold. But, you know, we want them to do the best we can for Jesus, because we love them, right? For God, because we love them. We appreciate it. So that's what we do. Father, we give you praise and glory and honor. And I thank you, Lord, that uh, you, through the Holy Spirit, do draw us close to yourself. You give us understanding. You convince us. You convict us of sin. And Lord, we confess that sin through the Holy Spirit. And Lord, you forgive us. You give us uh, redemption and forgiveness. And Lord, we just praise your name for it. Thank you, John, for the verse in 1 John 1 9. That tells us just that. And ask you, Father, to help us to know not only how to deal with ourselves, but how to deal with people around us. And give us patience. Give us your love. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.